So it was a long time coming. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to my mate Alex. Flew in from Europe to help me uh, road trip these ATMs to Vegas. We literally uh, threw two ATMs in the back of an Escalade and gunned it from the Bay Area to Vegas thinking, if we get pulled over for this, mate, we're going to have a hell of a way trying to explain our way out of it. But <laughs> we got here. Okay, right up here. All right. So yeah, like two ATMs in the back of an Escalade and about 6,000 notes of novelty currency. That'd be what on earth are you boys up to then? But uh, so the attraction to target ATMs is fairly obvious, you know, they're full of cash. Uh, but for myself, it's kind of part of a bigger picture and a bigger plan. And that's to explore systems that, when compromised, have uh, direct and immediate consequences. So whether it be uh, ATM machines, medical devices, smart meters, you know, the uh, computer system in your vehicle. Uh, particularly because they're not often designed with a secure methodology from the get-go. And uh, as a result of that research, we can use that knowledge to uh, design better and safer products in the future. So the goal of the talk um, is to spark discussion on ways to remediate and fix the, um, the vulnerabilities I'm going to be demonstrating. The goal isn't to give a cookbook recipe on how to hack ATMs. Um, the process of finding vulnerabilities, I think, is always more interesting. You know, the journey, not the destination. Although the, the destination is pretty damn cool on this one too. Though. And uh, I hope to change the way people look at devices uh, that, from the outside, are seemingly impenetrable. So current attacks. Um, probably all aware of the skimmer, which is certainly a fan favorite. It's a uh, small overlay that slides over the card slot and the pin pads manufactured to blend seamlessly with the ATM itself, uh, designed to capture both the track data and pin numbers. And the technology on some of these is no joke too, you know, it will send you the data over GPS and some even have like tamper protection so when they're found out it will wipe itself out. Interesting. Uh, physical theft and RAM raids, you've probably seen those various YouTube videos where a couple of good old boys hurl through the front window of a place, attach uh, chain to the ATM and the other end to the pickup truck and just gun it out of there. Not really the most subtle of attacks, of course, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of ninja status compared to some of the other ones. And card trapping and card snooping, it's where someone inserts a small shim, it's uh, commonly known as the Lebanese loop. Uh, it traps your card and it's designed in such a way that when your card's read, uh, the card won't be returned um, and it's often combined with shoulder surfing to get your pin but sometimes they'll get your pin in ways which may not be quite as friendly. Safe cutting and frontal attacks, basically going an ATM with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch. And explosives, which are surprisingly popular, which I find a little bit odd. Um, attack is literally tying a bunch of, an, bunch of explosives to an ATM and blowing the crap out of it. Now you'd think that would be uh, somewhat counterproductive to what you're trying to accomplish there, and it's big in Australia, so go figure. <laughs> And data breaches, hacking the bank processor, uh, harvesting the card data and pins. I suppose the best example of that would have been the hack of the uh, RBS WorldPay backend. And certainly the safest, most technically sophisticated the attacks I've seen. And I think about 9 million were stolen during that attack. And of course, other, or miscellaneous. <laughs> so we have uh, the default passcode attack from a couple of years back. And that's where if the operator password was left unchanged on the ATM, you could reprogram the ATM to think there was a lower denomination than it really was. So you probably don't think it was full of $5 notes when it's really giving you $20. And I'll be adding more to the other category, practical attacks, which I think I'll blow that, that little dweeb John Connors attack right out of the water. So I picked standalone ATMs. Um, there's a few, few reasons. One, they're pretty easy to get a hold of. Uh, like anything on the internet, you can jump online and just add to cart, basically. But. <laughs> Uh, getting the ATMs delivered to your house, on the other hand, is interesting. So um, I remember when one of the ATM delivery guys came in and he wheeled the ATM into my place and he's just like, why on earth do you need an ATM in your house for? And, <laughs> and, and I was feeling a bit cheeky that day, so I just looked at him and was like, oh, I just don't like the transaction fees, mate. And uh, also they're everywhere, right? The, every bar, convenience store, market, whatever it may be. And they're often in secluded areas, hidden out by the restroom, tucked away in corners. But um, I'm going to discuss attack methods for both standalone and hole-in-the-wall ATMs. 
I'll go over walk-up style attacks, but then shift focus to the far more important vector, in my opinion, and that's the remote attack. And what an attacker can leverage with a sex successful remote compromise. And when I mean remote, I mean remote default, because that's the only way to roll, really. So just to show um, how popular these ATMs are, this is literally one block just down the road from my place. Decided I'd just go uh, on a bit of a pub crawl and see what I could find as far as vulnerable ATMs go. Um, literally, yeah, this is half a mile. Um, my favorite is this dude, actually, who uh, owns a Mexican restaurant. He's a good sport. Notice about a type of tio resting on top of the ATM there. He doesn't, exa well, he doesn't exactly look chuffed to be in this picture. So the standard specs of a new model retail style ATM, uh, typically Windows CE running an ARM processor. New models support both TCP IP and dial up by default. Uh, wireless being CDMA, not 802.11, so no dri drive by ATM hacks, unfortunately. Thought it would be cool to you know, drive by a store and have it spit out its cash. No such luck. Uh, SSL support and the triple desk encrypted pin pads. Basically, the pin pad itself performs all the encryption on the device has anti-tampering mechanisms, and I'll talk more about that beast a little bit later too. All right. Is that better? Okay, so here's the ATM internals, uh, receipt printer. Over to the right, you can see the card reader. And there's a serial interface that leads down into the safe, which is actually wired into the dispenser. And there's also various motherboard inputs, multiple USB, SD cards, network, and some debugging ports. Now, there's usually a cover that protects the, the, the circuit board, and I've only removed it just to show the internals. I guarantee that these ATMs are completely stock, completely unmodified, totally untouched. Now, funnily enough, of all the possible ways that an ATM talk could get disrupted, um, it was actually my cat who almost took it down for me. I had like a USB keyboard plugged in, and he was running around chasing a moth or something and tripped over the USB cord, pulled it out, and pulled out the processor plug-in at the same time, but luckily it was easily soldered back in, but anyway, bad kitty. <laughs> so uh, in my opinion, a presentation shouldn't really be a full-blown technical tutorial, so I'm going to be following up later with a white paper that goes into more technical details. But rather than digging deep into the ins and outs of Windows C internals, I will sum up the, sum up the security hurdles I faced with this quote. We were concerned about protection, but not about security. We weren't trying to design an airtight system like Windows NT. <laughs> <laughs> and this was from uh, Thomas Fenwick, the guy who actually created the Windows CE kernel. And I got that from a book that was called Inside Windows CE, which was essentially just a bunch of interviews with the core developers. Uh, so obviously things have changed a little bit since that book was written, but to be honest, there were not a lot of roadblocks. <laughs> So before we can even think about giving the guy from Terminator 2 a run for his money and actually start devising attacks, first step uh, is to be able to interface with the ATM itself, gain access to the file system, and then with access to the file system, we can then pull the executables off to be able to do some reverse engineering. Now, unfortunately, when the ATM boots, it boots directly to a proprietary application, so there's no Explorer shell. So we need a shell to make things easy, and originally I thought I could just Naively, I thought I could just plug in a, U a keyboard and just Alt-Tab, but that wasn't to be the case, of course. So to get a shell, we'll need Explorer to somehow execute at boot time. Uh, the CE application boot sequence is pretty straightforward. The kernel nkxe runs filesys.exe, initializes the registry in the file system, and then executes the applications listed in the HKLM, HKLM in the registry key. So the trick is to patch the application we want executed into this boot list. So we want to get Explorer EXE into the boot list, and there's two approaches. The first approach assumes you actually have a copy of the CE ROM image. Uh, the registry file can then be extracted, modified, recompiled into the image. But this requires a way, of course, to rewrite the flash, whether it be over serial, Ethernet, JTAG, or what have you. Now, the other approach is to patch and explore while you're debugging, which, of course, requires debugging capability, JTAG, and so on. So I decided to go with JTAG, because it's a fairly straightforward way to accomplish our goals. Uh, JTAG is essentially a hardware debugging interface which will give you unrestricted debugging access to the processor core. Now the hardware for this stuff used to be pretty pricey, but these days with open OCD um, and some of the open source developments, you get the hardware for less than 100 bucks now. 
So with JTAG access, we can remotely debug with GDB, debug the kernel, bootload, and so on. Um, JTAG's been talked about, the def, uh, but talked about to death, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Uh, so this is the hardware debugger just connected to the motherboard. Now, it probably seems obvious, but the use of hardware debuggers and things of that nature have absolutely nothing to do with the ATM attacks that I'll be demonstrating. Simply used to initially gain access to the file system so we can reverse engineer to find vulnerabilities. Now, speaking of JTAG, I learned a valuable lesson when I was actually messing around one of the ATMs. I had the uh, JTAG hooked up, screwing around, I accidentally wiped out a massive chunk of the firmware, which unfortunately overwrote some of the core ATM files. Now, at the time, I was un unable to get the software for the ATM to fix it, so I had to call a licensed ATM technician. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and three of them came over to my house and again, you know, why do you have ATMs in your house? <laughs> I said, oh, you know, I haven't moved into the convenience store yet or whatever. And anyway, so he asked, what happened? You know, I've never seen something completely annihilate itself like that. And I was like, oh, I was just trying to change a splash screen, you know, I put in this little card and, you know, just crapped out. And he's like, oh, yep, yep, yep they'll do that, they'll do that, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> So the dude pops open the ATM and he's going on, I'm like, firmware, what on earth is that, mate? You know, I'm just acting completely stupid. Um, teaches me a lot about hacking ATMs. I got his business card, we kept in touch, but I, uh, <laughs> I think possibly after this presentation that relationship may be, may be severed. <laughs> but so yeah, the lesson was always back up your firmware. Um, so now that we can debug, we need a way to inject. Now, with the debugger connected, we set a breakpoint on create process, offset found by dumping the memory from the ATM and just doing a byte compare with an offline version of core DLL. Now, when working with the ARM process, uh, the parameters and pass the function are passed via registers before they utilize the stack. So R0 being the first parameter, it's going to have the executable that we want to execute. Now, we simply replace the string of the ATM executable, reads from the registry, override it with explorer.exe. Now, explorer.exe has to exist in the image for this to actually work. Uh, if not, you need to put a copy of Explorer on a removable disk and pass the full name to create process. But, you know, then you get a shell. So as simple as that, really. Now, when I was first playing with these ATMs, I was actually quite excited to have a shell on it. Um, have my ATMs play movies and whatnot. But, <laughs> but uh, probably not really surprisingly, ATMs are pretty crap for playing movies. Fairly slow flame, frame rate and a six inch screen, so they won't be replacing the home theater. Okay, so with Explorer, we can plug in a USB drive and keyboard and copy off the files for reverse engineering. Modify the registry so Explorer is always going to boot. Uh, remote debugging with JTAG, of course, is not the ideal, with GDB, is not the ideal way to debug a Windows machine. So the next step is to actually set up a more sort of user friendly debugging environment. So there's a way to debug Windows C applications without having Active Sync, and that's a bug with Visual Studio over Ethernet. Uh, you simply build an empty project, overwrite the local executable with the executable from the device you want to debug, with the TCP settings correct, it'll copy a file from the device, run on a debugger, and then you have application debugging in Visual Studio. So now we finally have everything in place to be able to reverse engineer the software to locate the vulnerabilities, but also to test any software we create for the ATM. So finally we can get to planning an attack. Now of course there's a limited attack surface obviously, uh, we have the card reader, but assuming we have an overflow or some other string-based attack via the card tracks, uh, there's an extremely limited amount of characters and a very restricted character set. I mean, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but I'll say it'll be unlikely to be practical or all that reliable. Uh, the keypads, possibly a long shot, but you never know. Maybe, maybe master passwords left in by developers, backdoors, what have you. And then the network, so any open ports, uh, answering phone line, any options for any possible remote attacks. And of course, the various inputs on the motherboard itself, but of course, this requires access to the motherboard itself. Now, of course, progress is never really made without a few failures along the way. And uh, in my attempt to come up with a Terminator 2 esque hack, I made this device. It's uh, basically an electromagnet wired up to an amp, which is connected to a media player. Uh, a web file is created to simulate the data on a mag stripe. Electromagnets plugged into the card slot, you play the web and thinks it was, it's, the ATM thinks it's just red and magnetic stripe. Technically it works fine, but um, it didn't help me for shit for finding vulnerabilities. Okay, so the walk-up attack. The, the goal, of course, is to execute code on the ATM. Now, the, the cache dispenser is housed at the very least by a safe. 
even if you, that's if you take the cheapest option. If you spend more, you can get some he fairly heavy-duty Volt-style protections. But the 